So hello. Um, thank you, everyone who's joined the webinar so far. Um, I'll start the webinar properly in a, in a minute. But before we get started, there are just uh, three housekeeping announcements I'd like to make. Firstly, um, everyone apart from me is muted so that we can avoid interference on the webinar. Um, secondly, if you have any questions as we go through the webinar, could you type them into the question box and I'll look at those at the end and try to answer them for you. And finally, the presentation and the slides from today will be available on the website following the webinar. So you should all receive a follow up email after the webinar with this information and links to the recording. My name is Jack Cross and I'm part of the developer team for Oasis Post. In today's Did You Know webinar, I'm going to show you some useful functionality in D3Plot and THIS that can hopefully save you some time in the future. The material I'm going to present is just a sample. So obviously, it's useful to go to the manuals and so on and find out uh, lots of other tips for, for these programs. But I'm going to present around 45 minutes of material, which is going to cover the following main topics. So I'm going to look at shortcuts. Um, and quick find and integration with primer and also undocking menus which are all features of both this and d3plot and then in d3plot we're going to take a closer look at user defined components and material extra data along with some uh, tricks for looking at contour plots um, and then we're going to finish off looking at this so we're going to take a, a look at fast tcf the curve table and also curve history So the first thing I'd like to do is highlight the availability of a large number of shortcuts in both D3Plot and THIS. So these can really help you with speeding up common operations. Um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with at least some of the shortcuts already. So shortcuts are mainly used to access common panels and actions, um, but you can also assign your own JavaScript and command files to them. Um, all the shortcut keys are customizable. So if you go at the top of THIS or D3Plot to Options, Shortcuts, as shown here, um, that will open up a menu where you can customize the shortcut keys. And the menu will look like something like the one on this slide. So this panel is, um, is useful for two reasons, really. Firstly, it um, shows you all of the different shortcut functions that are assigned to the shortcut keys. So uh, you can see what's what there. And then secondly, it allows you to change the uh, shortcut um, action that's assigned to a particular key. So you would do this by pressing the small arrow on the button next to the shortcut key. And that would fire up a menu with all of the different shortcut actions that you can assign to that key. Shortcut keys are case sensitive, so you can assign a different action to the lowercase and uppercase of each letter. But the default is for both lower and uppercase uh, shortcuts to be the same. I will be mentioning the default shortcuts as we go through the webinar, just to highlight how you can use those to speed up your use of D3Plot and THIS. Another potentially time-saving way of finding functionality is quick find. So quick find is a way of searching for and accessing functionality in both D3Plot and THIS by typing in search strings, and which brings up a list of matching functionality. You access it either by clicking on the magnifying glass button at the bottom of the tools menu, or by pressing the hash shortcut key. I'm going to show you a short demonstration of this in D3Plot. So if I switch to an open D3Plot session, um, you can see below the tools menu up on the right here, there is the magnifying glass button. And we can either press that or press the hash key to bring up the quick find text box. And then if we begin typing in here, D3Plot will find matching functionality. So I'm going to type OV. And that brings up a list of functions where OV matches the search strings associated with the functions. So you can see that D3Plot has found overlay display in the tools display options panel and some other 
potential actions where which contain an O and a V in the right order. So we can click on the uh, action that we want from the list for it and bring up the display options box where we would then be able to press these buttons here to change the overlay display. Of course, we could have done something similar with the shortcut keys. So if I press lowercase t, that tidies up my menus, so closes the menus which are open. And I could press O for display options. And then, or equally, I can press the Y key to cycle through those overlays. So you can see uh, Y goes to all edges, off and free edge as you press it repeatedly. Um, if I press the hash key again to bring up the quick find box again, um, and then I can type in uh, search strings with spaces in. So if I type in um, CLI space VOL, I may be looking for, I may have thought clip volume. Um, and where, where there's a space, D3 plot will try the search strings in different orders. So it's found volume clip, even though the, the CLI and the VOL occur in the other order in that string. What you can also see from this list is that the default uh, string associated with a particular function is the sequence of button presses that you would need to press to access the functionality. So tools, uh, volume clip at the top, for example. But some functions uh, like the data contour vector plots have um, alternative text associated with them, which is shown in brackets in the list. And that's to make it easier to find functions which may have more than one uh, name associated with them. So if we now go back to the PowerPoint, and uh, just to highlight that the quick find is available in THIS and D3Plot as well as in Primer. The next thing I wanted to show you was how Post and Primer can be used in an integrated way. And this is functionality that was actually introduced in version 15. So you will need to be using the, the more recent version of the, of the software. So with our product, you would traditionally look at LS Diner input files and results files separately. Um, although it would often be desirable to be able to look at both the results and the input at the same time. So maybe if you're looking at the results, you might want to look at the material properties for a part that has failed. Or if you were changing your model in Primer, you may want to see how it currently behaves in its current configuration um, in D3Plot. So in version 15, they, that facility has been um, added. So you can open uh, D3Plot or from Primer and vice versa. And, and see your input and your results in a synchronized way. This slide summarizes the links. So the link between D3Plot and THIS has been established for some time. So you can open THIS from within the D3Plot session to see synchronized results. And there are now links between D3Plot and Primer and THIS and Primer, which share memory and allow these programs to behave in a synchronized way. So this is best shown through another example. So if we leave the PowerPoint um, and I will go to the vehicle model again. So we're in D3Plot and we've got our results open and we may want to look at the input data at the same time. So what we can do is press the button above the tools menu, which is labeled primer and D3Plot searches for the keyword file associated with this model, which it's found, um, gives us the option below of uh, deciding which attributes of the model we want to synchronize between the two, and we'll leave all of those enabled for now. And then we can simply press the Start Primer button. And this starts at Primer, which will read in the model in this model, we need to browse to the include files. So Primer is opening up the model, but D3Plot's also sent across information to Primer about the uh, the view and the blanking status and so on. So 
when the model is opened in Primat, it will be opened in the same view as we have in D3 plot. Now, if I put these side by side on the screen, um, you'll see that the, the view is, is synchronized. And if we rotate the model in D3 plot, you'll see it also rotates in Primer. Um, I can blank parts in D3 plot, and those are also blanked in Primer. Um, if I press the, the B button, that would bring up the blanking menu. And I could also blank parts through the blanking menu, which you would see synchronized across the two programs. Um, I could also create a cut section in D3plot. And I could either do that by going to the cut section panel by pressing the button in the tools menu, or the key X brings up the cut section panel. Um, and if I want to pick a node to define the cut section, I can either press the pick visible button or as the brackets with the N in suggest, I can press N and then simply pick my node. Um, and then that cut section can be dragged again, either by pressing the drag key in the cut section panel or, or pressing the D key and dragging the cut section, which is then synchronized with primer on the left of the screen. The synchronization works the other way. So if we rotate the model in primer, that also rotates in D3 plot. And similarly, if we blank things in primer, they're blanked in D3 plot as well. It's also possible to access some of the primer functionality from D3 plot directly. So for example, if I right click on this part, I can, you can see that there are some green buttons in this pop-up menu with primer icons on them. And these are these launch um, panels within primer. So we can launch the edit part, so the modify part panel, for example, or we can look at the part table for that part and so on. And then when I'm, when I'm finished, I can close primer down and exit out of it, and my D3 plot session remains. Um, if I press, if I want to unblank the model, I just press U, and then I get the whole model. If I press A, it's another shortcut key that auto scales the model to the window. Um, there is similar um, functionality in THIS. Um, so this is the same model, and uh, I've read in a curve from that model. If I right click on that model, I would be able to select to either edit the entity that that curve comes from, so in this case, a part in Primer, or edit the curve here in Primer. So it would open up the define panel with the, with the curve values already populated. And the Primer button is in a similar location above the tools menu for THIS. The next thing, uh, on in the contents is undocking windows. So this is to this is to make it easier to work with the menu systems in post. So there are times when you're using D3 plot and THIS perhaps that you want to repeatedly use a particular menu without always having to click the corresponding button in the tools panel. Um, D3 plot and THIS both support undocking some menus, which puts them into a floating window, which can then be repositioned and can always be available to you. And you can also do this with THIS when you're in linked mode with D3 plot. Um, and at the end of your sessions, um, the status, i.e. whether a window is docked or undocked, and the position of the menus, if they're undocked, can be saved. And that would then be restored when you open up THIS or D3 plot in a new session. I will just give you a little example to show you what this looks like in practice. So we go back to the this vehicle model. To start THIS in linked mode, we've got the THIS button above the tools menu. So we can press that and that starts up THIS and reads in this model ready for results to be read in. Now, what you can see above the tools menu on the right uh, is the is an undock button. So where previously to, 
to work in D3 plot, you would have to press the D3 plot button, bring up the D3 plot panel, and then press the THIS button when you wanted to do something in THIS. We can now press the undock button. We can either undock the menus, which gives us a THIS floating window with the menus in, which we can redock using this dock THIS button, or we can undock all of the THIS uh, windows into a, a separate a separate window, which obviously would work well if we had two monitors, we could have these side by side. And we can dock this again back into D3 plot. There are, so if I just close the THIS, there are other menus in D3 plot that we can undock uh, even when we're not in linked mode. So the state selector, for example, has this small drop down on the top right. And we can undock that, move that around, redock it in the same way. And similarly, the part tree, for example, can be undocked and redocked. So to summarize uh, the docking and undocking of menus, in D3 plot, there are four menus you can undock. Those are the images menu, the part tree, the properties menu, and the state selector. And then in THIS, you can undock all of the operations menus, as well as the curve manager and the read menu. And as we saw, you can undock THIS when you're in linked mode. By default, those window positions are saved between sessions, but you can switch this off if you want to by setting the preference save window positions to false in both THIS and D3 plot. So now I want to concentrate on D3 plot for, uh, for a bit. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is user components and some uh, some ways of looking at contour plots that might be helpful. So user defined components are uh, allow you to um, create your own components derived from data that's been read into D3 plot. And there are different methods of doing this. So you can either read from a file, um, which is the format for which is, deter is detailed in the manual, or you can calculate the new component either using a simple formula or by using a JavaScript if you want to do something more complicated like include if statements in your um, calculation of the new component. So we'll have a look now at creating a user-defined component. So I've got a model here. Um, now I'm going to put it into an isometric view so you can see it better. And I can either do that with the buttons down in the view menu, or I can press the keys uh, one to eight, give different views. So if I press four, that's an isometric view. And then A again gives me auto scaling. And if I press Y to get the overlay on so we can see the mesh for this model. This is a welding analysis that's been carried out in Dyna. Um, now, if I plot von Mises stress on this model at a sort of intermediate time state, I can press the F key to give me a, uh, an SI plot. Um, so there we can see the von Mises stress uh, on this model. Um, what I can do is I can, I, I may be interested in utilization rather than von Mises stress. And one way to do that is to create a user defined component. We do that use, by pressing the user data button in the tools menu here. And then that brings up the user data panel and we can press new to create a new component. Firstly, we need to define what kind of component we're creating. So that's these buttons here. And we want to create a, an element scalar value. So we're going to click solid shell scalar. And then the automatically generated component name is not useful. So to, so it's better to rename it to utilization. We need to select our data source. So um, as I've said, you can either read from a file or a JavaScript, but in our case, we're going to create a simple formula because that will be the quickest way in this case. And then you type the formula into this text box at the bottom. Now the formula can refer to um, 
short strings which uh, correspond to each of the components that have been read into d3plot along with the operators like plus minus divide and so on now i know that von mises stress is s v o n and the material that is in this model doesn't have a yield stress defined so i'm going to just add the yield stress as a number and then that enables the create button so i can create this new component So now, if I press T to tidy up the menus, to go back to the data menu. So now in our categories list, we have user defined towards the bottom and we see utilization within that as a component we can select. And if I press F to contour that, you'll see that now, although the colors have stayed the same, the contour bar is updated to show the utilization rather than the von Mises stress. Now, this resulting contour plot um, shows that the area of highest stress is down in this corner of the model. Um, but it may be a bit difficult to see those elements. So there are a couple of ways that we can uh, make it easier for ourselves to see where the highly stressed, highly utilized elements are. The first way is to click on the contour band that we're interested in. So in this case, the highest contour band. And that has isolated those elements with a data value that sits within that band. So what, what's been done in detail is that we've turned on the limiting switch, which sits under the limiting valve tab in the data menu. And then the lower bound and upper bound um, values for that limiting switch have been set automatically to the contour band lower bound and upper bound values. Obviously, this isn't so easy to now see where these elements are within the model. So we can pick, we can turn on the outline of the model here, and then that allows us to see where those elements are in the context of the overall model. We could, of course, edit these numbers manually. So if I just typed in 0 0.2, you would see a larger number of elements get captured within that uh, limiting range. If I turn off the limiting switch, we get the full model back. And I'll go to the original view by pressing four. Another way of um, more easily seeing those areas of your model with a high or low data value is to use automatic transparency. Now, automatic transparency uh, is accessed through the levels tab in the data panel. And there's a button here, auto transparency, which you press. And that brings up the panel, which allows you to tailor the automatic transparency options. So we activate automatic transparency by ticking this active button. And what you'll see is that D3plot has set the transparency of each element um, based on the data value in that element. Um, in, in our case, we've got the transparency ramp set to magnitude. So that's this represented with this yellow curve here. So any elements with a data value that's close to zero will be highly transparent. And any elements with a data value that's at the extremes, positive or negative, will be highly opaque. You can change this to be a min to max or a max to min variation. So for example, if you were plotting minimum principal stress, max to min could be a useful um, alternative to magnitude because you would want to be highlighting only the most negative values. You can also change the shape of this curve. So we've currently got a second order curve here. Um, if we have a first order, so a linear curve, what you'll see is that the it, more of the model is, is less transparent. Um, and equally, if we go to an order four, you'll see that it's only the very highly stressed elements which are at all opaque. And at the bottom, there are some options for limiting the transparency um, and for setting the transparency of uncontoured items. I'll now deactivate automatic transparency. We'll go back to looking at the model. So 
while I've got this model on the screen, I also wanted to show you the support that we have for extra data components in D3Plot. So some material models in LSDyna allow you to output additional data components by setting either the NEIPH or the NEIPS parameters on the database extent binary card. The normal way that you would access these extra data components is by selecting the category extra and then choosing from the extra data components listed. So in this model, we have 12 extra data components for the solid elements. Um, and we get a list of basically solid extra one to solid extra 12. So if we select one of those um, and we contour that by, again, I'm gonna press the F key. This is what you get in terms of your plot. So you'll see that there are some drawbacks here. So firstly, the component is just called solid extra seven. So you would be needing to refer to some material reference data along with your contour plot to understand what this component was. Um, second thing is that these components contoured in blue actually don't have solid extra seven um, as, a, as a component. They don't have that extra data. So they are contoured with a, a value of zero, um, but that can make the plot more difficult to interpret. And then finally, it is possible to have the situation where you have two different material models in your, in your model, um, which both use the seventh extra variable, but for different um, physical parameters, in which case they would both be contoured with solid extra seven, and that could lead to a confusing contour plot. So there is um, a better way of doing this in D3Plot, which is to use the material properties category at the bottom here. And what that gives you is it then gives you a list of the extra variables, but categorized by material model. So we can see that the material here that's outputting the extra variables is MAT270. And we get a list of the extra variables for MAT270 with meaningful names. So the seventh variable is temperature last. So we can click that, we can update our plot. And there we see that we have a much easier to interpret plot. So the contour bar is labeled with a, a meaningful component name. The parts that don't output extra variable seven are contoured in gray um, to show that they don't have any data and the only the, the elements which are material 270 will be contoured with this component. The, all the data for this is stored in a CSV file in the D3Plot libraries folder, and it's in a, in a human readable form. So you can edit this, for example, if you wanted to change the name of this from temperature last time step to something else, you would be able to edit that CSV file uh, to change that component name. So now we're going to move on to some uh, tips for THIS. And the first thing I want to look at is fast TCF, which is a simple way of creating scripts to automate a lot of post-processing for similar models. So fast TCF is a scripting language for THIS, which helps to automate post-processing. Its big advantage over, for example, JavaScript is that you can automatically generate fast TCF scripts but with THIS. Um, and it's a fairly um, general uh, scripting language. So it has, contains all of the commands to set up uh, and position multiple graphs, to read in data, to perform curve operations, and to generate output. Um, and also, fast TCF scripts can be used in batch mode to automate post processing. So, we'll look at an example of creating a script. So, I've got an empty THIS session here. The first thing you need to do when you're creating a script is to open and process a model. So, I've got some variations on a crank design in these folders. So, I'll read in the first one. And then I'll read in some data. So we'll read in the internal energy 
and then we'll read in some SPC forces. And then I'm going to sum up the SPC forces to give a resultant. And now I want to arrange the curves so that they're displayed in a, in a better way. Um, first, I'm going to press the C button, which is a shortcut for the curves menu. And that's going to allow me to change the style of all these curves to be so I select all the curves here. I'm going to change the style to be consistent so that when I come to compare these with the second model, it, I, I can more easily see the differences. Um, again, if I press the T button and tidy us, tidy up the menus, um, I now want to create some extra graphs so I can show the different curves on different graphs. Now you can do this by going pressing the graphs button and uh, creating extra graphs here, or you can press the G key, which is a shortcut, and that will create, in this case, one extra graph because we've got one in this box. But if I change that for a two, and then press the G key, we get two additional curves. And then I can change where the curves are plotted um, using these buttons, the graph buttons below the tools menu. So if I switch off all but the first graph, I press the curve, the C button to get the curve menu back. If I go into the into the graph, I can press B to blank all of these. And then in a curve menu, just select internal energy. And if I go back to the graph one and hover over it and press the P button, that will plot that curve. In the second uh, graph, I'm going to plot the resultant SPC force. And that's at the bottom of this list, which is a fairly long list. I could scroll down. I could drag the scroll bar down. There is a neat trick in THIS where you can use the three different mouse buttons to help you with scrolling through these lists. So if I press the left button, I scroll down the list one row at a time. If I use the middle button, I scroll down 10 rows at a time. And if I use the right hand button, I scroll down 100 rows at a time. So I can fairly quickly navigate my way through a list using those three buttons. And I can select the force, sum of the forces there and plot that in the second graph. I need to select the second graph here um, and plot that there. And in graph one, I need to deselect that. And then in the final, in the third graph, I'll plot all of the remaining individual SPC curves. Now we can create a fast TCF script to reproduce these results automatically. So we would do that by going to the fast TCF panel by pressing the fast TCF button in the tools menu or by pressing F as a shortcut. Ensure that create is selected at the top of the panel and then select a file name for the script. So I'm going to put the script uh, in the directory, the parent directory of these models. I'm going to overwrite this script that's already there. I'm going to select all pages. So you can select what you're creating script to recreate, but in this case, I'll just tick all pages to capture everything. I want to have the image output, so I will make sure that that's being output to the right location, the parent directory. And you can output curve files and curve groups and variables if you want to, but here we won't. And once this is set up, you hit apply to write the script. Now what we can do is we can close down this session of THIS and we can open up a new THIS session and see how we can use this script to recreate those results. So what you need to do firstly is to read in uh, the results of a model. We're going to actually read a different model, so Crank Design B. This is a similar model. And so we apply that to read in the results and we can then run the script, so fast TCF button or the F key again. 
And this time we want to ensure that we've got the run button at the top pressed. And then we browse to find our script, default.inp. Now, if we'd written a script that had more than one model, that processed more than one model, we could make sure that the script, we could make sure that the model one in the script was referring to the correct model in TIS by pressing model mapping here. Um, in fact, we've only got one model, so we don't need to worry about this. And then once well, this is ready, we can press play and the commands in the script are executed to reproduce the curves that we had um, in, with this new model. So often, so this is successfully worked um, and, and we have our new results for crank design B. Now often we would want to compare these results to a different model and we could use our fast TCF script again perhaps to help us do that but there is a shortcut that T has offers us. So in the read menu, so we click read in the tools menu um, and we select new model. We can now go to the model we want to compare with. So I'll go back to crank design A and we can select this tick box here, which says extract curves to match model. And we've selected model one. Um, and then we can copy this curve styles from model one if we want to, but to make it easier to make the comparisons, I'm going to say set styles. And then I'm going to set the styles to be a different color and a dashed line. And then we hit apply. And THIS essentially runs a fast TCF type script to reproduce the results of the second model. Now, so, so we've got the comparison we want um, for internal energy and we can see that the um, sum of the SPC forces is matching. What I want to do is move the curves from for the second model from graph three to graph four. Um, so what I'll do is I'll blank the curves in graph four to start with by pressing the B button, B key. And we're going to use the curve table to do this. So the curve table is um, is a way of accessing various functionality that allows you to filter and sort your curve data and then manipulate how that data is shown on different graphs. Now you can also change the style of your curves through the curve table as well. So we'll, we'll look at that continuing on with this example. So if I press the T button, to tidy up the menus. And then you can see that there's a in the curve manager, there's this table button which launches the curve table, or you can press X. So that brings up the curve table that we can see here. So the curve table is a list of all the curves in this session of THIS and some groups of curves at the bottom for model one, and model two, which are automatically generated. You can see there are various columns of information and we can sort the curves by any of these um, any of these columns. So for example entity ID if we click on there we sort the curves by the entity ID. Um, we can sort by ID. We can also move these columns around if we want to reformat the table. So I may want to put the model uh, we simply drag and drop these across at the beginning and we can drag and drop the entity ID next to that, for example. On the right hand side, you can see an array of tick boxes. Um, each column of this array, so one, two, three, four, represents one of the graphs. And then the ticks represent whether, indicate whether the curve is plotted on that graph. So I can, by um, sorting this list by type, I can bring the, the groups, the model one and model two groups to the top. And then I could deselect model two from graph three. And I could add the model two curves to graph four. If I then sort by ID, um, and I can also filter these curves so I can, so these boxes at the top allow me to filter the curves which I can see by various um, parameters, but I can filter by model to remove model one, make it easier to see the curves I want to remove from graph four. So I don't want the internal energy on there. 
And I also know that at the bottom, I've got my um, sum of the SBC forces, and I want to remove that as well. And I can remove the filter. I could press the clear or filter options button. And then we can see in the in the background that the so I've now moved all my individual SPC curves for crank design A onto graph four. Graph three is just showing my crank design B. Now if I bring the curve table up again by pressing X, there's a final bit of functionality on here to show you, which is that you can customize the way that your data is shown in this table. You do that using the view button. So the view button lets you select and deselect which columns are shown. So I can untick some of these columns and they will be removed from the curve table. I can click them again to put them back. Um, it also allows you to display items in, in a grouped way. So you can group the items by model or you can group them by common items. So here you can see that in both models, we've got an entity, uh, a node 1024, which have both been grouped here. You can also choose to include only, only groups, for example. So in the back, you can see that we've now only got the, the groups for model one and model two, or just the curves, or both. And then finally, quite a useful um, thing is that you can display the model number by by default by model numbers so we then get this model file just as a, as a number in ts the order that we've read them in it can be more useful if you display that as something else so for example we can get the ts file name and that can make it much easier to um, distinguish between your models and keep track on what's what's where so that is the curve table. I will go back to the PowerPoint now. Now we've talked about the curve table, done the example. So the last thing I want to talk about is in tedious and that's the curve history. So curve history is a it's functionality that allows you to look at the sequence of operations that has been carried out to generate a particular curve and then also to modify those operations and update the curve so again i'll show you this in an example so i've got a this session here i've read in three uh, acceleration curves from a vehicle model so these are xyz accelerations we're going to do some operations on these first so first i'm going to do some filtering I'm going to apply a C180 filter to all of these curves. So, so that's given me three new curves, which are all uh, filtered. I'm then going to do the vector sum of these. So X, Y, and Z. I'm going to create the vector sum curve here. And then finally, I'm going to just multiply that last curve by a constant. Again, if I press T to tidy up my menus um, and I'll blank the original curves um, plot by pressing P, plot those that curve. So we can see our original curves at the bottom here, the vector sum of those, and then the scaled vector sum at the top. Now, if I right click on a curve, I can view the history of the curve. That brings up a panel. And what this is showing is it's showing the sequence of operations that have gone through to create this curve. So if I look at the, the read operation at the beginning, it tells me which model and the ID of the node and the component and so on that has gone in. It tells me the operations that have been carried out. Now I can modify these operations. So for example, I could change to a C60 filter on each of these. And these are then highlighted in blue to show me that they're modified. And I could click to update the curve. And if you, if you watch the curve in the background, we'll see that that gets updated with that lower frequency filter. 
if I pick a curve like the um, X acceleration curve, this is this is a curve that has some dependence. So we can list the dependence here, which is actually curve number seven, which is the curve you can see in black there. Now, if we change the filtering to a C60 filter, we can update, we could, up, could update just this curve, but we cannot choose to update the curve and the dependence. So if we press that button and look at the screen, we can see that both the um, curve that we've looked at the history for and the dependent curve have updated. So that's a useful way of um, being able to visually see how uh, a curve has been derived. So that brings me to the end of the presentation uh, part of this webinar. So thank you for listening. Um, I'll now check whether there are any questions that have been submitted through the chat. So there are some questions. I'm just a couple of questions which I'm going to scroll through. So the first question is, are additional licenses necessary to run D3 plot, primer and or THIS simultaneously? Um, and the answer to that is that yes, generally yes, they are. So if you are in Primer, or, well, if you're in D3 plot and you um, open Primer through the link, then you would need a Primer license, and, and that link would would take the Primer license. Similarly, with running D3 plot from Primer, um, you would you would use a D3 plot license to do that. Um, there are there are some subtleties to the licensing which enable potentially D3 plot to use a primer license if uh, if a D3 plot license isn't available. Um, but it would be best to um, ask your uh, whoever installs the programs for you about the details of your particular licensing. So the next question is. Can you use fast TCF to output CSV files? Um, that's a question. I, I'm not sure the answer to that question, I'm afraid. So I can um, I can ask that that question is answered in the follow-up email that comes through. So I'll take a note of that and then um, include an answer for that in the follow-up. Uh, there's then a question that says, when performing an operation on a curve in THIS, is there a way of automatically blanking the input curves? No, there isn't. Um, but what I do is I'll note that down as a suggestion, um, something that, that people may find useful. Um, so the next question is that someone is not able to watch Oasis pre, did you know, webinar from the website. Can you suggest the way to watch it also for today's webinar? Um, I, I believe that the Oasis pre-processing Did You Know webinar may not yet have been uploaded. Um, what I will do is I will check that that's the case, um, and I will um, I, I'll ask our administrator to forward you on the link again. So um, that the the videos or the, the recordings of the webinars should also be uploaded onto the YouTube um, channel as well. So you should be able to find them on YouTube as well as through the webinar um, website. So that's the last question. So it just remains for me to say thank you very much everyone for attending. Um, there is further information that's available on our website. So www.arap.com slash diner. Um, and if you think of any further questions, please email your local distributor. Um, the email addresses are shown on the slide here, um, which you'll sh you should receive in the follow-up email to this webinar. Thank you very much.